dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky, of visitors the fairest, for occupation this, the spreading wide of narrow hands to gather paradise. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door to her divine majority, present no more. Unmoved, she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. I've known her from an ample nation choose one, then close the valves of her attention like stone. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. The bustle in a house, the morning after death, is solemnest of industries enacted upon earth. The sweeping of the heart and putting love away, we shall not want to use again until eternity.
ageless mother is, impatient of no child, the feeblest of the waywardest, her admonition mild, in forest and the hill, by traveler be heard, restraining rampant squirrel, or too impetuous bird. How fair her conversation, a summer afternoon, her household, her assembly, and when the sun go down, her voice among the aisles, incite the timid prayer of the minutest cricket, the most unworthy flower. When all the children sleep, she turns as long away as will suffice to light her lamps, then bending from the sky with infinite affection and infinite care, her golden finger on her lip wills silence everywhere. The sun kept setting, setting still, no hue of afternoon, upon the village I perceived, from house to house, t'was noon. The dusk kept dropping, dropping still, no dew upon the grass, but only on my forehead stopped and wandered in my face. My feet kept drowsing, drowsing still, my fingers were awake. Yet why so little sound myself unto my seeming make? How well I knew the light before, I could see it now. Tis dying I am doing, but I'm not afraid to know. The martyr poets did not tell, 
but wrought their pang in syllable that when their mortal name be numb their mortal fate encourage some the martyr painters never spoke bequeathing rather to their work that when their conscious fingers cease some seek in art the art of peace I started early, took my dog, and visited the sea. The mermaids in the basement came out to look at me, and frigates in the upper floor extended hempen hands, presuming me to be a mouse aground upon the sands. But no man moved me till the tide went past my simple shoe and past my apron and my belt and past my bodice too and made as he would eat me up as holy as a dew upon a dandelion's sleeve and then I started too and he, he followed close behind. I felt his silver heel upon my ankle. Then my shoes would overflow with pearl. Until we met the solid town, no one he seemed to know. And bowing with a mighty look at me, the sea withdrew. If you were coming in the fall, I'd brush the summer by with half a smile and half a spum, as housewives do a fly. If I could see you in a year, I'd wind the months in balls and put them each in separate drawers until their time befalls. If only centuries delayed, I count them on my hand, subtracting till my fingers dropped into Van Diemen's land. If certain when this life was out that yours and mine should be, I toss it yonder like a rind and taste eternity. But now ignorant of the length of time's uncertain wing. It goads me like the goblin bee that will not state its sting. How many flowers fall in wood or perish from the hill without the privilege to know the 
they are beautiful. How many cast a nameless pod upon the nearest breeze, unconscious of the scarlet freight it bear to other eyes. She sweeps with many colored brooms and leaves the shreds behind. O oh, housewife in the evening west, come back and dust the pond. You dropped a purple raveling in, you dropped an amber thread, and now you've littered all the east with the duds of emerald. And still she plies her spotted brooms, and still the aprons fly, till brooms fade softly into stars, and then I come away. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry, and breaths were gathering firm for the last onset when the king be witnessed in the room. I willed my keepsakes, signed away what portion of me be assignable, and then it was there interposed a fly with blue uncertain stumbling buzz between the light and me, and then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. Dear Mr. Higginson, your kindness claimed earlier gratitude, but I was ill and write today from my pillow. Thank you for the surgery. It was not so painful as I supposed. I bring you others as you ask, though they might not differ. While my thought is undressed, I can make the distinction, but when I put them in the gown, they look alike and numb. You asked how old I was. I made no verse but one or two, 
until this winter, sir. I had a terror since September. I could tell to no one. And so I sing as the boy does by the burying ground, because I am afraid. You inquire my books for poets. I have Keats and Mr. and Mrs. Browning. For prose, Mr. Ruskin, Sir Thomas Brown, and the Revelations. I went to school but in your manner of the phrase, had no education. When a little girl, I had a friend who taught me immortality, but venturing too near himself, he never returned. Soon after, my tutor died, and for several years, my lexicon was my only companion. Then I found one more, but he was not contented I be his scholar, so he left the land. You ask of my companion hills, sir, and the sundown, and a dog, large as myself that my father bought me. They are better than beings, because they know but do not tell. And the noise in the pool at noon excels my piano. I have a brother and sister. My mother does not care for thought. And father, too busy with his briefs to notice what we do. He buys me many books but begs me not to read them because he fears they joggle the mind. They are religious, except me, and address an eclipse every morning, whom they call their father. But I fear my story fatigues you. I would like to learn. Could you tell me how to grow? Or is it unconveyed, like melody or witchcraft? You speak of Mr. Whitman. I never read his book, but was told that he was disgraceful. I read Miss Prescott's circumstance, but it followed me in the dark, so I avoid her. Two editors of journals came to see my father's house this winter and asked me for my mind. And when I asked them why, they said I was penurious and they would use it for the world. I could not weigh myself, myself. My size felt small to me. I read your chapters in the Atlantic and experienced honor for you. I was sure you would not reject a confiding question. Is this, sir, what you asked me to tell you? Your friend, E.